pleasure to introduce our um, keynote speaker and also via uh, web, uh, our uh, annual business and law speaker, Oliver Hart. Oliver Hart is the Lewis P. and Linda L. Geiser University Professor at Harvard University. He was the co-recipient of the 2016 Svigas Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel, that is the prize, of course, more commonly known as the Nobel Prize in Economics. His scholarship and the relationship between contracts, property rights, and the boundaries of the firm has had a significant impact, not only on economic scholarship, but of course, on legal scholarship. Uh, he visited Western Law uh, in 2018 to uh, present a paper he had co-authored with uh, Lu Luigi Zingales called uh, Companies Should Maximize Shareholder Welfare, Not Market Value. Uh, and today uh, we're, he'll be presenting what I might think of as, as sort of the sequel to that uh, paper based on further work he's done in this area since that time. I'm delighted and honored to be able to welcome him today here to our symposium and vicariously to, uh, to London, Ontario. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Oliver Hart. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, uh, for the introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a very uh, interesting, exciting conference for me. I'm only sad that I'm going to have to leave. I have, I have to get home uh, today. And so I'm going to uh, leave right after my talk, which is definitely saddens me, not least because uh, Marcel is going to be talking about something related. But at least I was able to be here for the morning. And uh, some of the dis quite a bit of the discussion there is also very relevant for what uh, I'm going to be talking about. Um, as a as, uh, Oops, wait a minute. As, as Chris said, this is joint work with Luigi. We're continuing this project, uh, still working on it, partly because we, you know, progress is slow, but also uh, the world is changing. And so there are new things to be said. Um, so let me start off with something which hardly needs to be said, given what we've heard. Um, in the last few years, there's been a dramatic increase in shareholder engagement on environmental and social issues. Um, and here's a picture which so, uh, sort of illustrates this. Uh, I think it complements some of the uh, things um, that, that uh, Bill was talking about um, in the, on the panel. Um, so what we have here are um, the average support for different types of ESG. Um, we've heard from Elizabeth that ESG is a complicated thing, but anyway, you can divide it here. We're, we, we're getting rid of the G, but um, splitting it up into environmental issues, political, social issues. And um, you look at those, you see there's a very uh, clear trend upwards. Um, if you go back to 2000, we're talking about things, you know, below uh, 10 percent. This is the average. This is the average support for such proposals. This is in the U.S. So uh, in 2000, you know, it was 10 percent or lower. And now, uh, if you look at um, 2022, you see um, you know around 30 percent, and indeed it was it was higher than that in in 2021 for the environmental ones, getting you know majority support in some cases, um, and that's uh, you know I think the dip is because the big three are getting nervous about uh, being accused of being too woke, so they've sort of backed off. Um, but uh, things may, ch I, I think, will change again. Now, um, it's hard to explain this behavior, um, the support for these shareholder resolutions using the dominant corporate governance paradigm, um, which is uh, the traditional view is that shareholders um, want the companies that they own to maximize shareholder value. We've heard a lot about shareholder value um, this morning, and I'm going to come back to it uh, quite a few times um, uh, because I don't think it's uh, right <laughs> that that uh, that that is the right criteria, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, okay, so why is it hard to um, reconcile the evidence in those pictures with um, the traditional view? Well, because many of the proposals. Um, 
are pushing companies, the ones that are getting a support, are pushing companies to do things that might reduce shareholder value, uh, most of which are opposed by management. Um, why have things changed? Um, you know, why is this entrenched view, which has held, you know, been accepted for a long time, that shareholder value is the only thing, and now we see this apparently shareholders supporting things. I, I'm going to give some examples, so things which may reduce shareholder value. Why have things changed? We think um, there are at, at least three reasons. First of all, corporations are larger, more complex, and more powerful than they were in the 70s and early 80s when the traditional paradigm uh, became established. Um, the world is also uh, bigger now, more people. Um, it's become more interdependent, and that means uh, the importance of externalities um, has increased. And of course, we have climate change, the biggest of all. And many people feel that governments are not dealing with these externalities. And this is, a, I think, a particular issue um, when you need coordination. I mean, it's, it's hard enough to get a national government to do um, the right thing, in quotes, you know, e.g. to implement carbon taxes, which is what almost all economists think is the right way to deal with uh, climate change. Um, that's hard enough, but when you're talking about coordination um, by different national governments, which is what you need to solve these global problems, that you know, seems impossibly hard. Um, okay, so government isn't, isn't doing its job. The third thing that people talk about is that young people are different. They have, uh, they're, they're much more concerned with um, things other than money. Uh, of course, I mean, I come from the 60s generation and people thought the 60s generation was going to change the world and, you know, look what happened. So, um, <laughs> but uh, maybe this time will be different. Okay, anyway, we think for all these re reasons, the paradigm needs to change. And this is true even if one accepts, as we do, the idea of shareholder primacy. Um, we, we do accept that because most companies are set up um, in that way, they give uh, the votes to shareholders, and that suggests that the company is meant to act on um, shareholders' behalf. So we're not challenging that. But what we are arguing is that when externalities are important, which we think they are, and uh, when investors are not purely selfish, and we think that's true too, then um, the appropriate objective of a company is not shareholder value maximization, but shareholder welfare maximization. Now, I want to give some examples to show how there can be a tension between these two things. Um, so um, some of these examples, I think a couple of them are based on actual shareholder resolutions, proposals. The other two uh, are not, but they, you know, they, they could be. Um, so DuPont generates large quantities of plastic waste. Uh, and, and the question is, how do um, shareholders uh, feel about this? So reducing the waste, waste would improve the envi environment, but would reduce profit. Um, some shareholders may favor this, others not. Um, why? Well, some shareholders uh, may um, be concerned about the impact of the waste on the profitability of other companies they own. So even though the waste may reduce DuPont's costs, it may spill over um, uh, onto the, the costs of other uh, companies. That's one possibility. Second possibility is that the shareholder may actually experience the negative consequences of the waste themselves, the environmental degradation. Third possibility is they don't experience, and experience it themselves, but they care about other people who do experience it. In other words, they're not entirely self-interested. For whatever reason, the shareholders like that may be actually willing to, uh, may want DuPont to uh, reduce the waste, even though that eats into the bottom line. But of course, other shareholders may have different preferences. Maybe they're not, don't have a diversified portfolio. They're not personally affected by the waste. Um, they're so, they don't care about anybody else. So they may, uh, feel differently about this. So there you have a, a conflict. Um, second example, Costco uses antibiotics in raising chickens. This is profit maximizing, but is a major cause of the development of antibiotic resistance, a problem that costs human lives and uh, billions of dollars in healthcare costs. Again, 
uh, if we ask how do shareholders feel about this, if there's an up or down vote on this, some might vote uh, in favor of um, not using antibiotics or using less of them for, for the reasons I indicated with DuPont, you know, they have, they're not just concerned about um, Costco's bottom line. Others may be concerned about only predominantly about Costco's bottom line and would um, vote to continue what Costco is doing. Um, Danco is the US distributor of the abortive patient drug Mifiprex, in other words, an abortion pill. Um, it's a private company, but one could imagine, and this is, this is a hy hypothetical, um, you know, there could be different shareholders of Danco. Some might be very anti-abortion and they might want Danco to scale back its, even act, its activities, even though these, um, selling the drug is, is generating profit. Other shareholders may want to make abortion more readily available. And so they might actually want Danco to expand beyond the profit maximizing point in, in um, selling this stuff. Um, final example, Duke Energy makes contributions to political candidates and parties. Uh, disclosing and or reducing these could be good for American democracy, but might reduce shareholder value. Again, some shareholders are concerned about the bigger picture, other shareholders uh, may not be. So disagreement. So the point of all these examples is, uh, well, let's start off by noting that, you know, Milton Friedman's famous argument, um, which appeared in the, uh, this 1970 article in the New York Times magazine, um, where he was saying companies should just make as much money as possible and then um, hand that over to their shareholders who can then use their increased wealth to do good in the world. This argument fails in, in these examples. Um, I, th I think Friedman's argument makes sense when it comes to charitable contributions. Why should a company give to charity rather than ha you know, handing over the money to the shareholders and then each one can give to their favorite charity? That seems very convincing. A bit. But when it comes to the kind of examples I was talking about, let's say plastic waste. It's not the case that if DuPont generates lots of plastic waste and makes lots of money, then shareholders can use their increased wealth to clean up the waste. That would obviously be, apart from the tremendous coordination problem, there's also the fact that getting rid of the waste may cost much more than the profit you made from generating the waste in the first place. Um, the thing is, um, you don't have separability here. Charitable contributions are separable from the company's business, um, but plastic waste or, or um, um, the, 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 the Costco example, these are things which are, uh, what, what the company's doing there, which causes the externality, is inextricably linked to its ordinary business activities. Um, and in those, so in the situations where you don't have separability, there's no reason just to say what I, you know, repeat what I was already saying. There's no reason to think that SVM, shareholder value maximization, will be unanimously favored, right? I've given examples where a shareholder of, of DuPont might. Uh, for whatever reason, for several reasons, might um, want the waste to be reduced, even though that reduces um, profit. Um, so it's no reason to think it's going to be unanimously favored, nor is there any reason to think that it is socially efficient among the group of shareholders as, as a whole, let alone for society. So uh, again, um, uh, well, let's, let's use the the Costco one, right? So there's an argument about using the antibiotics. There's no reason to think that the people who um, don't care, about, only care about the bottom line, that that group of shareholders could bribe the shareholders who have bigger concerns to um, vote for uh, continuing the antibiotics. In other words, I'm, there's no reason to think that the, the, the uh, bottom line shareholders, that their um, uh, willingness to pay uh, for what's going on exceeds 
the willingness to pay over the other group to stop what's going on. If, you know, I'm, I'm imagining a hypothetical Cosian bargain. Of course, it's, we couldn't really arrange that with large numbers, but if you could arrange it, it's not at all clear it would end up with the, with the result that you should uh, continue using the antibiotic that might um, go the other way. Um, final point, you know, some people in this area, you know, sort of typically devotees of Friedman um, say something that Friedman himself said. He suggested that deviations from uh, shareholder value maximization impose a tax on some shareholders. So, you know, if the Costco people, the, the, the shareholders, um, uh, the majority says you should stop using antibiotics, uh, and that's going to reduce shareholder value. That is a they're imposing a tax on the other shareholders, which doesn't sound nice, right? But the point to realize is it's completely symmetric. If uh, the, the, the shareholders who want to continue the antibiotics win the day, they're imposing a tax on the people who don't like the use of antibiotics, whatever, you know, for whatever reason. So there's, I don't think this tax argument um, helps us here. Okay, the conclusion so far then, I, I would like, I don't know whether I've convinced you, but the basic uh, argument is we, we don't, uh, we shouldn't just stick with SVM as obviously the right thing. We have to entertain the possibility that shareholders have more complicated uh, tastes and in some cases are willing to uh, accept a reduction in um, share price uh, in return for something else, the greater good maybe, or I mean, it could be, as I say, returns, you know, an increase in share price on other uh, in, um, uh, share prices of the other companies they own. But I'm actually more, Luigi and I are more interested in this other possibility. Actually, the last thing that people are actually somewhat altruistic and they just don't like the idea of um, these bad things happening to other people as a result of their uh, company's actions. So how could we move away from uh, SVM towards SWM. So social uh, um, shareholder welfare maximization just means taking all these other factors into account. Well, one way to do it is uh, voting, shareholder voting. Um, and I've already sort of uh, hinted at that and we've heard about this already today. You know, we have these shareholder proposals and um, shareholders can uh, vote on those things, uh, put them up, vote on them. Um, if they are approved by a majority, um, well, in the US, those are just advisory, you know, pre precatory, as I'm sure you all know. But these days, that doesn't seem to be so much of a problem because if the board ignores what, what a majority of shareholders um, want, then they are in danger now of being voted out at the next board election. Um, so they're sort of likely to pay some attention. Now, but there is a problem um, right now, particularly in the US, maybe probably in Canada as well, and in other uh, jurisdictions, that uh, most stocks are owned through mutual funds. And we've heard about the big three. And these institutions do the voting for their investors. Um, that is for us. I mean, we are the ultimate um, owners, we, we, we invest in companies through Van, through BlackRock, say, um, but, um, you know, BlackRock is not, BlackRock holds the shares, but is really answerable to its own investors who are individuals. And, um, okay, so these institutions do the, the voting for us, and they also take the view, they have taken the view, and in many cases continue to take the, to take the view that their fiduciary duty uh, to us requires them to uh, act in a way to maximize long-run financial return. Um, and so that means that when they vote on things, they would be always thinking to themselves, what is this good for um, long-run uh, return or is it not? And that's how they would vote. And in some cases, this is a legal requirement when it comes to pension money in the US, ERISA. But in other cases, it's not actually legally required. But that's what they do. Now, I'm going to give you a, an example of this um, to show, again, the tension here. Um, and this is a pretty current example. So Austria, a German-listed uh, real estate investment trust, proposed a so-called green dividend to shareholders at its May 2021 shareholder meeting. 
the proposal offered a 0.01 euro per share dividend and asked shareholders whether the dividend should be paid to them or be invested into pre-identified climate mitigation projects. Um, so I think this was, uh, you couldn't make an, it wasn't that you could put out, give up your dividend. It was either um, everyone was going to give up the dividend or everyone would get the dividend. Now, this Austria already pursues climate mitigation efforts as part of its normal business activities, such as purchasing 100% of its energy from re renewable sources and undertaking an extensive uh, carbon reduction plan. Um, according to the company, what set these additional climate mitigation projects apart is that they would not have made compelling investments for the company to pursue from a purely financial perspective. So the board said that if shareholders supported the project investments, they would treat this as a clear mandate to invest outside the financial norms. Well, now enters, uh, we, a new player enters. Uh, Dimensional Fund Advisors is a very large global asset manager um, that is a shareholder of Ulstria. And some people will know about Dimensional, not least because it was set up by the booth of Chicago Booth Business School. And he was very uh, influenced by the work of uh, Eugene Farmer. And indeed, Farmer and also his uh, co-author, Ken French, have been uh, closely associated with this company since it's certainly Farmer since its uh, inception, and they still are. Um, <clears throat> so what did Dimensional do? So, um, you know, it's an asset manager. It engaged with Alstra's CEO to discuss the green dividend proposed by the company. Um, Dimensional emphasized their view that the duty of the board, that is of Alstra's board, is to maximize shareholder value and that they appreciated that the company's uh, proposal was put in quantifiable financial terms. But of course, the company was saying this would not maximize shareholder value. Uh, Dimensional also took the view that they have a, their obligation to their own investors was to um, maximize value. And so um, what did they do? They voted against the proposal. Now, in spite of this, the proposal passed with 85% support. But I think what's interesting about this is that Dimensional was taking, I think, a very narrow view. Um, they did not go to their own investors. One thing they could have done is gone to their own investors and said, you know, how do you feel about this? They didn't do that. Instead, they just said, our duty is to maximize shareholder value. This does not, so we'll vote against it. Um, and, you know, I, I think uh, Luigi and I, uh, think this kind of situation makes so, no sense. We think fiduciary duty, duty of loyalty, means acting on behalf of the people you represent. How, uh, it should mean that, however it's, it's currently um, thought about or defined in the law, and that means finding out what shareholders want, the ultimate shareholders, and perhaps learning that they are willing to make trade-offs. So, um, how could we change things? Um, I think there are three approaches in broad terms that are possible. The first one is to push down the voting decisions to the level of the individual investors, the retail investors. Um, this is a strategy that BlackRock um, has started to implement with its major investors in the US. Thus, um, if the New York state, so you know, some of its investors are other institutions, not uh, and then, of course, behind them are the individual investors. But um, if New York State Common Retirement Fund invests in BlackRock S&P 500 ETF, uh, it will have the right to vote pro rata the shares it indirectly owns in all the S&P 500 companies. OK, so pushing the voting decisions down, um, um, BlackRock gets uh, at least partially out. So some of these institutions uh, can say, no, no, we want you to continue to do the voting for us. But BlackRock is at least partly getting out of the voting business uh, if it you know, continues to do this. Um, this strategy might work well for, for major um, pension funds and endowments, big investors in BlackRock, but it's unreasonable for individual shareholders because, um, you know, 
we cannot expect shareholders to uh, to look at all the ballots, right? There are lots of proxy um, ballots that, that come through every year, and uh, it would be a big burden for us all to be, you know, spending our time. We have jobs, we have a life. We don't want to spend all our time combing over these things and deciding which way to vote. Um, but there is a solution, which is that there are um, proxy voting guidelines available out there. Out there. Um, they are, um, so six, uh, ISS has six of them. And I believe there are more, because I've seen the number 14 I'll come um, mention. So uh, these are guidelines uh, geared towards um, specific interests or interest groups. So there's one on, on labor, um, there's one on um, socially responsible investment, sustainability, which we heard doesn't, what does that mean? But um, faith-based ones. So, you know, if you're a Catholic, um, you're probably gonna have certain attitudes to social things and there would be a guideline, you know, there's, there's one tailored to you um, provided by ISS. And you could imagine more of these things uh, becoming available. And um, then what you do is you basically say, I, I'm going to just pick one of those, and then someone else is going to vote my shares according to that guideline. I don't have to uh, spend my time uh, reading uh, proxy statements. Um, and yes, so that could happen. And by the way, let me say that just um, I think eight days ago, I read that BlackRock is going to extend um, this voting, this possibility of, of voting by individuals um, to, to individuals, you know, not just to the it's bigger uh, investors, but all the way down to individuals. It's going to do that in the UK. It's going to see how that works next year. There's a sort of pilot program to do that. And, um, and yeah, so things are changing. Um, this pushing down is see, uh, the vote seems to be happening. Now, the second strategy would be for the mutual funds to in, elicit um, their investors' preferences um, about the kind of trade offs they're willing to make. So it's already the case that, in some cases, I think more in Europe, um, uh, mutual funds um, try to find out their investors' attitudes to risk. Okay. Um, now, what they can do in the future. Uh, and in fact, it's already happening. This is this is happening. Um, that you can ask people about the kind of trade-offs they're willing to make. Would you be willing to give up a uh, hundred dollars to reduce uh, a ton of carbon emission? You know, re reduce carbon emissions by one ton. Would you be willing to give up two hundred dollars, and so on? This kind of thing. And then you could uh, use that information to decide how to vote at the you know, Larry Fink could decide how to vote based on that information, as opposed to, you know, what happens a lot of the time is he just makes the decision himself. Uh, now, economists will know that, you know, there's, there can be an issue when you try to um, find out people's preferences that they may not report truthfully. And so you have to wor worry about incentive compatibility and so on. And, you know, I'm, don't have the answer to that, but it does seem to be a way forward, and it's one that um, is being used. Um, the third strategy is for mutual fund companies to um, offer investors funds with a um, predetermined voting strategy. So basically, um, you know, Vanguard could have a fund which says, you know, we are going to, and remember, I'm talking here uh, entirely about engagement as opposed to um, divestment. So as opposed to picking, you know, an ESG fund where you um, exclude certain stocks, the dirty companies, uh, this is a different approach that I'm talking about. Um, we might be talking about an index fund. It, it has everything um, in it. S&P 500 or the, whole, or the whole US market or the Canadian market or whatever, but it announces, uh, you know, we're going to stick with these companies because we're indexed, but we're going to be pushing them to change in particular ways, right? And they would sort of indicate what their policy posture is or the, what their voting posture is going to be. And then um, if you like that idea, you can put your money with them. So you could have competing 
S&P 500 funds, you know, one of them would be a kind of have a green approach, then you might have the one that um, the Vivek, whatever is Ramaswamy, is it? Yeah. Strive, is that the, the, okay, that fund is what I call a Friedmanite fund, right? Um, he, he, he's all about, I'm going to be pushing companies to maximize profit and nothing else. Okay, if you like that, you put your money into that S&P 500 fund. Meanwhile, you know, other people will put it into a greener, um, one with a, a fund with a greener engagement strategy. And this is actually happening. We heard earlier about engine number one who had, um, that had this uh, extraordinary victory with ExxonMobil. And they, they set up a, um, a pretty much an S&P 500 fund, but with a voting strategy, and it's called vote. Okay, um, I'm just going to, um, I really, that, that's what I wanted to say. So let me just um, summarize, conclude, make a couple more observations. So, I mean, the bottom line is uh, that SMV, SVM, should I say, shareholder value max maximization shouldn't be the bottom line. I guess that's the, um, it's, it's been, it's, it's so well established. We heard about it this morning. Uh, it was interesting when Elizabeth put up that slide with, you know, Goldman Sachs. It was all about, yes, um, you know, we're, we're signing on to this United Nations things because we think that these environmental factors are very important for the bottom line, for, for maximizing shareholder value. There was no notion that maybe that isn't the right objective. But what I've tried to um, uh, convince you of today is, and you know, go back to my DuPont, Costco, and all the rest, Duke Energy lobbying, um, lobbying may help the bottom line. It may be terrible for the world. As a member of the world, a citizen of the world, you may say, no, I don't want that. Um, so um, I don't think, you know, it, I think it needs to be abandoned. Um, Obviously, I don't want to, these social things do not impact on every decision. In some cases, of course, uh, just increasing profit is, is the right thing to do. I'm not saying it's never the right thing to do, but the point is it's not always the right thing to do. Um, okay, I've said that one way to move, I think, um, to a situation where it, it gets, uh, you know, it's no longer the, uh, the one and only thing is to make it easier for shareholders to express their preferences um, on, on social issues, on environmental issues, uh, e.g. by voting. I also think that uh, companies, not only mutual funds, but the companies themselves should be trying to find out what their shareholders want, as opposed to thinking of shareholder proposals as um, you know, something to be uh, knocked down, to be always bad news. Uh, no, I mean, they're meant to be acting on behalf of their shareholders. They should want to know what the shareholders um, want. Um, now the SEC, um, so here this is a US um, bullet point, but I, I, it may well um, apply to Canada as well. Uh, the SEC in the past has not been very helpful. Um, they haven't been supportive historically of shareholder proposals. They've helped companies in many cases exclude them um, from the ballot. Companies say, we don't want this on the ballot. And the SEC has said, fine, we support you. Why? Because the SEC is, has, has taken the view that anything which is about the ordinary business of the company is something that, that directors should be deciding, not shareholders. Okay, uh, Luigi and I think this is crazy. Um, the examples I gave are all about the ordinary business of the company, the plastic waste, the antibiotics, the lobbying, all that stuff. And yet they do raise social issues. And those are precisely the ones where the sh uh, shareholder preferences, I think, should be paramount, the kind of trade-offs they're willing to make. Um, I think the meaning of fiduciary duty should be reconsidered, uh, which may require changes in the law. And finally, and I think this is really important, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of repeating myself, but I'm sort of, I want to just emphasize it, that um, trade-offs need to be acknowledged. So, you know, when you talk to people in this space, uh, whether they're asset managers, whether they are um, 
uh, company executives. I mean, to the extent it's very much like what we saw on the Elizabeth slide that they, many of them will say, of course, ESG is terribly important. We, we're very much uh, in, in favor of all of that because it's a risk factor for us and we need to consider it because it's going to be good for long run shareholder value, right? That's what they say. Uh, they'll sign on it. But then as somebody, as, as I think was said on the panel, you know, if, uh, or, or, or um, maybe it was Gail who said, I can't remember. But, um, you know, if that's all there is to it, in fact, that's, that's business as usual. It's just that the uh, current management is sort of not, you know, they haven't thought about things the right way. They, they think they're maximizing shareholder value, but they're not really because they're not taking into account what climate change might do for the company. But um, I don't think that's the right way to think about it. Uh, once you realize there are trade-offs, sometimes um, what's, what the shareholders want may actually be, they may say, no, that would be more profitable. It's legal. There's no regulation against it. But we don't like the we wouldn't do that in our personal lives, and we don't want you to do it either. So that that's a situation where there's a real trade-off, and but it's just amazing how um, many people in this era just aren't willing to um, recognize the possibility of trade-offs. They're in a win-win world. What's you know what's good for society is good for profits. It can't be true, right? It would defy the laws of gravity, but that's what they believe. And if, if you push them on it, they just, they, you know, they don't want to hear it. Uh, they can't hear it. It's not part of their mindset, which I, and I really think that has to be changed for us to move forward. Let me stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much. We do have a few minutes for questions now for the benefit of uh, our folks watching the webcast, uh, if you could wait till Amelia, if you have a question, if you wait till Amelia gets to you with a microphone uh, before you ask it, does anyone have a question? Roberta. Thank you. So I just, in a side comment, um, I think on the SEC, and then I have a question. The SEC proposal is not as narrow as you say, because they have an exception for socially important topics that change over time. So you can get in precatory proposals. So. It may not be as uh, necessary. But that's now, right? I should, yeah, it's, it's changed. Well, no, what changes is what they think is socially important, right? So in, they used to, at one point, they didn't allow things about employment, like discriminating. And then uh, 10 years later, they said, okay, that's important. You can put it on. So it's a floating thing. Well, all right. right. I was being, anyway. let me just say that back in 1970 or something, yeah, 1969, then, yeah. it was very different. It was, yeah, a lot of it's changed. And I'm, uh, so I have a question, but one other aside is you, when you listed uh, things that change, I would have put down, I would have thought you would have also put down the increase in intermediaries. Um, there is some debate in the literature about whether intermediaries, what their fiduciary duties is, and that presumably has affected, since they have more votes, they can vote more if they do on these things. When you listed like just young people, in fact, the intermediaries, if they're reflecting well, young people, then they do that too. Okay, right. maybe I should have added index funds, perhaps. Yeah, as a, yeah. Yes. that's what I was yeah. So my question is that, so some, most of the states now have uh, benefit corporation statutes that actually um, say you can, you know, and the rest of the statute is the same, but they allow taking stakeholders into account. So I'm wondering, that, I mean, I'm all, I mean I, I'm all for your suggestions about letting uh, shareholders express their preferences, so I think those are good, but I'm wondering what you think about that. So if we had companies just um, under that statute, right? Is that an alternative solution? And then we have a clientele effect. You're arguing for a clientele effect on voting, right? But maybe you want a clientele effect in actual investments, right? If you were worried about a tax either way, then you wouldn't have that question. Um, we don't give appraisal rights to people for votes and maybe we should do that, that's an alternative. And then if there was someone who was unhappy you know, I don't know how you, it would be hard to value that, but I guess if you saw the stock price results after it, you could use it. So that's an, another sort of possibility, right, um, of thinking about broadening appraisal rights um, when it's benefit corporations. And I guess um, if, you, if you thought we could, the government could impose a, an externality tax. Um, so, okay, we don't have a carbon tax, but some of these aren't really carbon related. Would that solve the, would we need this approach if they did that or would we still want this approach? all interesting points. Uh, let me start with the last one because that's the most, the simplest. Yeah. Um, I think the answer is if the government was doing its job perfectly, we wouldn't need this. 
Um, it wouldn't actually be a problem because everyone would vote for profit maximization. It would be fine, but you wouldn't need to have all this machine, you know, bureaucracy. Um, so, uh, okay, the appraisal uh, rights and corporations. So, oh yes, benefit corporations. Well, um, I must admit, I, I should know more about them than I do, but I also think that's partly because not that much is known about them. They're fairly new. Um, my understanding is that they, um, it, it's sort of unclear who makes sure that they stick to whatever purpose they have. So what I think I like about what I'm suggesting here is that shareholder democracy is actually a way to keep the company honest as it were as a, and i think they can also change what they well you may know more about it but I, I i'm not sure that's the solution um now the second thing was the appraisal right yeah so if you were worried about tax one way or the other oh uh, well i i i wouldn't want um the so the idea would be say okay we we adopted well we got rid of selling the chickens at cost up yeah. So some people were upset and they want to praise rights. Now, if the market came up and said this was good, rights of the stock didn't go down, then they wouldn't get any appraisal yeah, rights. Yeah. But if it went, so right. that's the sort of idea. I mean, I think it's maybe it's that, but I mean, I the trouble with that is it's going to, if you have to buy them out at the profit maximizing price, then um, I, I think that, that you're paying them too much. I mean, this is democracy. It would be a bit like, you know, if I, uh, vote for the losing candidate in the presidential election, someone has to pay me <laughs> because I've suffered. Uh, and I, I don't think that's the way it, it, democracy works. Well, it's, it keeps your suffering. <laughs> well, I, I, I can assure you that I, I would have got a very big side payment. <laughs> in at least in one case I can think of, if that had been possible. <laughs> uh. Any other questions, David? David Sandomirsky from Western Law. Uh, this may be a very naive question, but imagine we have uh, two ETF funds. One tracks the S&P 500 with a freedom vote and one tracks S&P 500 with an ESG vote. Do you anticipate uh, in all circumstances that the value of that ETF uh, stock would be the same because they track the same underlying investments? Or do you think something about the different preferences uh, uh, on the market would change the relative value of those uh, share price? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, mean, I don't have a firm view about that. It, I can imagine a world where, I mean, after all, um, whoever is in the majority in the vote that's going to be binding on everybody. So, you know, if the Freedom Fund loses out to the ESG fund in the voting, then the Freedom Fund is going to have to pay the price. The share price will simply be lower. So in that respect, they should be selling for the same. Now, um, on the other hand, it could be that there are different costs of running the fund. Uh, I mean, it depends, you know, uh, maybe the Freedom Fund uh, just always supports management, so has zero uh, transaction costs, whereas the other fund, um, you know, it's a little more, they have to do some work. So that could change the prices. Um, it could also be, as I think you were sort of hinting, um, at that, um, you know, some people would actually be willing to pay more um, for, the, for the ESG fund because they, they think it's the right thing to do. But I, I don't insist on that um, for, the, uh, for the idea to work. Uh, Mark, uh, Marcel, and then. Uh, sorry, Amelia, this is Marcel. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's Oliver. I was. I, I think you make a very good case that uh, that companies should be maximizing like shareholder utilities. But I was thinking while you're talking, is the voting mechanism that you are proposing, and it goes as it's in line with Roberta's question, is that a good uh, way uh, to elicit shareholders' true uh, true preferences? So when I vote as a shareholder, 
uh, I will vote assuming that my vote is pivotal. And if my vote is pivotal, um, I will get the benefit of the company's action, uh, but the cost that I'm bearing is only my very small uh, proportionate cost. So my vote may be very, very different on whether I own 0.1% um, of the shares, where I get the same benefit, but they are very, very small cost. If I own 10% of the shares, where I get the same benefit, but now they are 100 times the cost or, or 100%. I would think from a social perspective, intuitively, I would think is that we would want all shareholders to vote is if they owned hundred percent of the stock, but do we get that result? I don't think so. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe we shouldn't want shareholders to vote if they owned hundred percent of the stock. But it'd be kind of weird if if we kind of like exploited the dispersion of shareholders to get a different result. And let's say all shareholders are homogeneous; they all have the same belief, but we get a different vote if each if we have a thousand shareholders who own. 0.1% or single shell rolls 100%. So I'm not sure what's the answer is, but I'm sure you have thought about that. I'm really glad you raised that because yes, I have thought about it. We have a paper um, which deals with the, exactly that issue called Exit Versus Voice, and you can find it on my website. And I'll give you the answer. The answer is not quite, I mean, you're, you're definitely right partly right, but not entirely, because it turns out, at least in, given the assumptions of that paper, which one can certainly question, um, that small shareholders are going to do the right thing. Um, because the reason is, um, at least in, our, in the model uh, that we have, um, a, sh a shareholder looks at the personal cost of them, on the one hand, and then they look at the social benefit on the other hand, and they put some weight on that. So, you know, they're not purely altruistic. So um, some, of, you know, some of them may put a small weight, some a bigger weight, but anyway, it's 100% weight on themselves and then less than 100% on everybody else. Now, um, what goes into the everybody else category? Well, um, you, you know, if, if um, um, the company, let's say, was going to, um, reduce the externality, okay? Um, at, at let, Let's take a simple example where it was going to avoid dumping waste in a river, and that would be costly, okay? So what you would be thinking to yourself, as you said, as a very small shareholder, that cost is, uh, I, I bear a negligible part of that cost, right? But then, but I do care about my fellow shareholders, so I, the, the, the rest of the cost borne by them gets, gets factored into the social part, but then there's also the social gain from not having the waste. So what I'm looking there is at the social benefit minus the cost by my fellow shareholders. And then because my cost is negligible, that term will be actually net social benefit. I'll put some weight on that, the, my own thing goes to zero because I own practically nothing. And so I will actually vote for the thing if it's socially beneficial and against it if it's socially not beneficial. So we actually get a rather surprising, it was surprising to us result that small shareholders have the best incentives. In fact, a 100% shareholder is much less likely to vote for the right thing because they bear the full cost themselves. And then the, the social benefit only gets, you know, less than 100% weight because they're not altruistic. So it goes against, the, you know, the conventional wisdom is that large shareholders are a good thing because they um, help deal with the principal agent problem. But here you get the exact opposite, that is actually small shareholders have the right objectives. Now you can quarrel with the details of that, but can I uh, suggest the paper? <laughs> it's all, that's what it's all about. The longest conversation. The, yes. the, and can we have, this is our last question. Are you aware of uh, any action uh, where the problem is framed in terms of reputational risk? And therefore, if the directors fail to adhere to proper uh, ESG, uh, whether it's donations or actions in a meaningful way, uh, they in fact expose the corporation to 
um, well, themselves uh, to uh, breach a fiduciary duty because of the reputational risk that the company could suffer, not just uh, in the market for its shares, but more germane, uh, in trading with uh, customers, et cetera, in the community. Are you aware of any, anything along those lines? Well, I think the question there is, why, why wouldn't that be factored into market value? You know, if, you're, if we have efficient markets, which one could of course question, then long-term reputational risk you know, affects the bottom line. So it should all... Um, so of course, in practice, directors can also, you know, be, the business judgment rule protects them against almost everything. But um, <laughs> isn't that part of the business judgment? Because in fact, uh, if your customers find out that you're not making uh, proper or taking proper steps to be contributing to ESG, then in fact, they don't want to be dealing with you and they'll have pressure yeah, against yeah, you. So, yeah. so that's, that's part right. of the reputational risk. Sure, but that, that's still part of what I call the win-win yeah. approach, which is, uh, of course, if we don't do the right thing, um, consumers won't buy our product, workers won't work for us, and that's going to affect shareholder value. And that's why we will consider those things. So I, I think of those as the easy cases conceptually, because they're still consistent with the, the old paradigm that shareholder value maximization is the right thing to do. But I'm more interested in going into this new territory where uh, it, what's, you know, you may be doing it even though um, the reputational risk isn't that great. And, and, but you still think it's the right thing to do, or rather your shareholders think it. It should, I think, be the shareholders' preferences, not the, the uh, board's preferences. We're going to have to stop things there. Um, I want to thank uh, our speaker, Oliver Hart, for uh, once again giving uh, an outstanding and interesting paper, and uh, which I think is it, it's, it, that, that paper's published in the... Uh, Yes, it's published. Um, not with. I had to, uh, there are a few things in the slides which are not in the paper. But yes, it's published in the University of Chicago Business Law Review. Yeah. So, uh, and I encourage everyone to yeah. uh, who hasn't who may not have read it yet, please do uh, read the paper uh, again. Very, very provocative, uh, stimulating, and informative. Thank you again uh, to uh, Oliver, and uh, we'll now take about a about a ten minute break. Our next uh, presenter will be uh, Marcel uh, at 1.30. I see Alan is here now, uh, and uh, Francesco I know is here as well. Uh, so a break for about 10 minutes, but in the meantime, please join me in thanking Professor. <laughs>